friends out here at the kiln today 150 degrees i've had it right there for about 24 hours so we're gonna go ahead and shut it down and this load of poplar will be done so what I like to do whenever I turn the kiln off is open up these doors and let the vapor kind of come out of there. If there's any kind of moisture kind of hanging out, it'll come out these doors here for about 30 seconds or so. Because if there's any moisture that was hiding in this poplar that didn't come out during the drying, it came out when I had it cranked up to 150 degrees, no doubt about that. Had to step inside the shop for a second. It's really windy out there today. It's nice, it's about 65 degrees. But guess what, people? At five o'clock, thunderstorms are coming. I tell you, the weather here is just amazing. You can't get a decent week of decent weather without rain, it seems like. It's nice and warm, but gosh, it rains all the time. So we're talking about that poplar. I put it in there Friday when Curtis brought it over. Yesterday morning, which was uh, Wednesday morning, it was showing 7% in most of the boards. That's pretty fast, but it's four quarter lumber. I think he said 80% of that lumber had been air dried already. There was only a few boards that felt kind of heavy and most of them showed about 10 or 12% moisture content. So that's pretty fast right there. So Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, you know, right at five days to dry that down to 8% then 24 hours at 150 degrees to sterilize it. And if you're new to this channel, what I'm talking about is the last 24 hours of the kiln cycle, I closed the vents, I locked the door down, and I turn off the compressor and I'll run that heater up to 150 degrees and hold that for 24 hours. And what that does is it does two things. With pine, it sterilizes it plus it sets the pitch. For all other timber, it sterilizes it, which means it heats that wood up to 130 degrees, which is about the industry standard for heating wood up to kill any kind of buds in it. So if there's any kind of eggs in there, larva, buds, insects, all the above, it's gonna kill them. And that's really important. Cause I sell most of my wood to furniture makers and you don't want a guy calling you back in six or nine months and saying he built a table with some walnut and the customer called and there's a pile of sawdust there in the table because there's buds in it. That happens a lot. I've heard a lot of horror stories from people coming over here buying lumber from me who've bought wood from other places that's been air dried or so-called kiln dried. Who knows what their process was. And they, you know, later on they got a call back from the customer and stuff had cupped really bad and, you know, a lot of terrible things had happened because of that. Sterilize your wood. You know, 100 years ago, people air dried everything. That was just fine. But nowadays, everybody's got heat pumps in their house. Everybody's got some kind of air conditioning going on. And, you know, climate controlled houses are different from houses 100 years ago. You know, you got to have this stuff dried down properly or it's going to move more than you want it to move when it goes into somebody's house. So let's get back outside and I'll show you guys what I've been doing here for the past day. I've not had the camera going here for about two days. So here's the tie beam I started in the last video and it's just about completed. Got my tenon right here. Got my reduction going in. I got every one of my joists roughed out. Those two right there are actually finished. And I have how many left? One, two, three, four, five. I got six more to go. That chain mortiser makes these easy guys i'm telling you jim rogers when he was down here from up north a few weeks ago he showed me a trick on how to use that mortiser to hog out most of this material then followed up with the chisel i missed that little piece right there but that will break right off when i start doing my chisel work on it but these go really fast you come in here with a corner chisel and get your corners i use my robert sorby one inch chisel on my walls and you know just a few minutes and you're done it's what you know there's a cat again Trying to explain something here, Lucy. Do you mind? Get down.
different for you. All right, friends, got some more white pine on the sawmill today. This is about an 11 footer. I need to get an eight by eight post out of it. And there's gonna be a few problems with this log. Uh, one of the problems is there's a lot of knot clusters toward the bottom. I'm not sure how big those knots are gonna be once we get down to the middle of this timber. If they're too large, I may not be able to use this one. I don't mind a few knots on these posts, but I don't want, you know, you don't want a real big one like this, you know, that'd be, that'd be not so good on this timber frame here. It might hurt the structural integrity of the barn. And also on the same far end, the diameter is pretty small compared to this end. There's a lot of taper in this log, a lot of taper. I'm gonna have to use these tow boards a lot today and get this pith leveled up and take out this taper. Even though this log has a big discrepancy in the diameter from one end to the other, there's still a nice straight eight by eight post hiding in the middle. Just gotta find it. So real fast friends, before we start talking about this log and go over the measurements, I wanna share something with you guys out there that run sawmills. I get asked a lot what kind of tools you need on hand if you're running a mill on a daily basis like I do. And one of the main things that you need is a good flashlight. Now this is not a paid endorsement or sponsored video or nothing like that. This company's not paying me to say this. I carry a flashlight everywhere I go. I've been carrying a flashlight on a routine basis probably since about 2000, 2002, 2003 when I started my law enforcement career when I was a cop. That's one thing you had to have on you in your pocket. Every day was a good flashlight. And these pocket flashlights are just perfect for that. And that's something I've always done over the years. I left law enforcement back in 2016 but I still carry a flashlight with me every day. And you know, it's just a good thing to have in your pocket. A pocket knife, a Leatherman, and a flashlight. That's a great everyday carry to have. So this is an Olight flashlight and uh, it's the new MR2 Warrior. It's extremely bright. I charged it up the other day and used it for the first time yesterday. And it's just amazing how bright the flashlights are getting nowadays and the technology of them. I've been using flashlights for years, these little pocket ones, and 10 years ago, you can get nothing this bright. It's, it's just amazing how bright they are nowadays. But I'm sharing it for this reason. There's a link down below to this flashlight. You can go buy one if you like. And I advise you guys who are running sawmills to have some kind of flashlight in your toolbox or on your person. Because there's all times, you know, bark getting stuck in the wheels and all kinds of places on this mill. And you need a flashlight to look in there and try to see what's going on. So right here in the back of the flashlight is the port that you charge. There's nothing to plug in there. Here's your charging cord, and this is all you gotta do. Ain't that something? That's pretty neat right there. I've never thought they'd come up with something like that. That makes it so much easier to charge these flashlights. You don't have to plug it in the side or nothing like that. Let me grab the measure tape now. We'll go over these measurements, and I need to show something on the debarker as well before we get to solid. Down here on the operator side is gonna be the large end today. If I can catch that bark without coming off. 22 inches in the diameter that way. About 22 all the way around. Not bad, like I said earlier, this is Eastern White Pine. All right guys, down here on the far side, it looks like we're at about 15 and a half inches on the diameter. So a pretty good discrepancy here from end to end. We'll definitely use the tow boards today to raise up this pith and get that pith centered like we always do here before we cut it out. I'm going to use a new method today to square up this post. My buddy Chris Coon came up here about two weeks ago from South Carolina. He runs a wood miser down there plus a Lucas sawmill and an eye dry kiln. And he gave me a pointer on getting these timbers perfectly square. So I usually get these posts pretty square. I'm really particular about that, but sometimes they're off just a little. Sometimes the timber will move or sometimes your clamp will move over too much and force the timber to come out of alignment just a little with the saw head and you'll be out of square, maybe a 32nd, maybe a 16th of an inch, which isn't a real big deal. You can't even see it unless you get on here and really measure it and inspect the timber. So Chris has a pretty good method, I think, for getting these things square that works well for him. And if it works well for me, maybe it will for you guys also. And some of you people out there running sawmills may already use this method, I don't know. I've never seen this method done like this. I've heard about people on the forestry forum doing it like this, but I've never actually seen it in practice or tried it myself. So if you're on the sawmill out there and something you run into is trouble getting a timber perfectly square, which there's a lot of people run into that problem. I've run into that problem many a times. This might be the answer to get you over that. So right here is the debarker and what this does, it travels in front of the saw head, 
on the same plane as the blade and knots the bark off, which keeps the blade from getting dull so much faster. Works really good. And my question I get about this all the time is what does the blade actually look like? Well, here you go. It kind of resembles a circle saw blade with these little teeth on here. Looks like about every two inches it looks like. And they're not really that sharp. There's no real point on here that will really cut you. It's just the velocity they're moving at and the way it hits that bark, it knocks the bark off and clears the path for the blade. So that right there is what the debarker blade actually looks like. Friends. I had to cut the camera off for just a second. My battery's getting low and I thought I would show you guys what I'm doing here. I went ahead and started on finishing this timber up on this thickness right here. I liked what I saw when I was sawing down into it. So I went ahead and made some one inch boards. I'll put those on and edge them later. We'll get some nice little one by sixes out of those. But right now this timber is about 10 and a half inches thick. So what I'm going to do is get on the AccuSet 2 and set my final cut depth of 8 and an eighth inches. And I'll go ahead and auto up on one inch intervals and probably get one board out of this and probably a, uh, a waste board, probably a quarter inch thicker. So I doubt I'll get two boards out of this, probably just get one. But that would get me to my finished dimension of eight and an eighth. And then we'll flip it up on its side and I'll show you guys what I was talking about earlier in my new method here that will hopefully get these timbers perfectly square. Now I hit the auto up feature and if you're buying a sawmill and you do a lot of dimensional sawing, this AccuSet 2 is well worth the money, guys. I love it. And once you get this dialed in, you can set different preferences on these numbers. There's a ton of presets on this. I think number three is going to be one inch boards right there. So it looks like we're just going to get one board. We'll go back now to auto down. That way when we make that cut, we'll go down one inch and be at our finished dimension. We'll have a waist cut off the top. Looks like about an eighth of an inch maybe. Then we'll have a one inch board.
Right now, friends, now usually when I square up a timber, this is my third cut. I make two reference faces, you know, one cut turned into 180, make another cut, then I put it up on its side like this to make the very important third cut, which is you want to either put the timber perfectly in square or it's not. And usually I'm done right here. I usually just put it up on its side, clamp it over, I make sure my clamps are all lined up, that there's no bark between the clamps and the timber or on the saw bed. And usually I call that done and I make this third cut. So the problem I run into sometimes when I make this third cut, the timber is not perfectly square with the saw head that's gonna be traveling on this top cut right here. And what I mean is either I clamp too hard because that clamp is so powerful it will push these bat stops over if you clamp too hard. That will throw you out of alignment. And sometimes you just, you know, it's a mistake you make. You bring that clamp over, you clamp it up, and you try to get it lined up perfectly on these back dogs. But sometimes by doing that, you push too hard and it knocks them out of alignment. And the worst timber that I ever get is about a sixteenth of an inch out of square, which is tolerable in my opinion. This timber is going to shrink anyways. It's not going to matter in the long run. If it was a quarter inch out of square, that would be a, you know, a definite problem right there. But this way Chris Coon described to me over the weekend how to fix this and make it perfect every time may solve this problem that I have. So uh, let me go get a framing square and show you guys what he was talking about. We'll try it out and see what happens. All right, so what Chris uses is just a regular framing square and he puts it over here on the saw bed. Smack. Nasty pine resin knocked off. He brings it over and I can see right there it's out. So that's uh, it's actually out about an eighth of an inch right here toward, uh, toward the bottom. So if I would have went ahead and made this cut, my timber would have been out of square by that much. So that's uh, that's more than I like to see right there. A sixteenth is about as far out as I like to have it. An eighth of an inch is really far out. So this is how we're going to try to fix this. Instead of relying on the sawmill to cut perfectly square, since that clamp does come over and push on these bat stops. In this case right here, I need to probably raise the clamp up a few inches, then push over. That will probably decrease the gap we got down here at the bottom. So let's get this lined up and see how it goes. I think we'll be okay. That really makes a lot of sense to me once I got this square out. Because you're always cutting square to the bed. So this should work pretty well. Famous last words. It should work pretty good though. We'll make this cut, put the square back on it. See how it looks. All right, friends, check it out. A perfectly square eight by eight post. No daylight showing anywhere underneath the framing square. Chris Coon, good job, buddy. That's a great method. There's probably a lot of other people out there using that method. But I've never seen it before. That's what I use from now on. Also, just to add, we've got the pith. Right there in the middle. You are a part of me, and you will forever be the God of the days now when we left. There is no asking why our love would come to die. You know the reason it's meant to be For love is a